الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونوله ما بعد. So I promised you a quick pop quiz. So Asif, quickly. Yes. Number one, Ummahat al Mu'minin. Let's now memorize them all together. Number one, Khadija. Number two. Oh, that you're going like this. Okay. Number two, Sauda. Number three. Aisha, but the consummation happened later on. So the nikah took place at this time. Number four. Number four. Hafsa. So actually, Aisha and Hafsa are actually uh, in the order that يعني, we know Aisha and Hafsa, right? Number five. Zainab binti Khuzayma, right? And Zainab binti Khuzayma, uh, what is the main thing about her that we need to know, the most important thing? She passed away. She passed away within within a few months of marriage, so that's why we hardly have any details, right? This is Zainab bint Khuzayma, and then we said uh, one of the uh, tidbits about Zainab bint Khuzayma is that her half sister eventually also became uh, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu and that is Maymuna bint Al Harith, and we'll talk about that uh, in a while. And then number six is Umm Salama. Number six is Umm Salama Hind bint Abi Umayya uh, al Maghzumiya, and so as of yet, the only uh, non Qurashi wife is Zainab binti Khuzayma as of yet there will become more later on as of yet so the first six wives of the Prophet Sallallahu only one of them was non Qurashi the rest were all from the Quraysh of course later on this is going to uh, change now uh, we now move on today and today we're going to do another of the controversial topics uh, and that is the expulsion of the Banu Nadir the expulsion of the Banu Nadir and this is a precursor to the battle of Ahzab so the expulsion of the Banu Nadir is a direct precursor to the Battle of Ahzab. Why? The Banu Nadir are the main, gul um, the main guilty uh, party or the culprits of the Battle of Ahzab. The main people who actually instigated and planned and prodded people to do it, they're the Banu Nadir. Right, so that is why, in fact, this story links directly to the uh, Ahzab story, even though today we're not even going to get to the Ahzab. And in fact, there's a very big issue that took place in between that we're also going to spend maybe two days on, maybe even three. Uh, uh, we'll see, inshallah ta'ala. Now, when did this happen? So the Banu Nadir, a uh, bit of a controversy when it took place. For now, let us assume that it took place uh, after the incidents of Ar-Raji'ah and Ma'una. Ar-Raji'ah and Ma'una, which took place in Safar in the fourth year of the Hijrah. In Safar in the fourth year of the Hijrah. And if you recall, one of the Sahaba who had been spared from the massacre, Amr ibn Umayyah, on the way back, he met two people from the very tribe that had done the massacre. You remember the story, right? Remember the story, it's a, it's a bit of a complicated story and that's because obviously as usual the details are sparse, you need to piece it together. But piecing it together to re ref refresh your memory, it was the tribe of Banu Amir. There was somewhat of a, not a civil war, that's a big issue, but somewhat of a big clash between the Banu Amir. You had the main elder who had promised the Prophet Sallallahu don't worry all Muslims are safe. Right? And then you had his nephew who was struggling for power and who disobeyed his uncle and who then committed the massacres uh, in particular of uh, in particular of uh, Ma Ma Bi'r Ma'una. In particular the Bi'r Ma'una massacre, he completely ignored what his uncle had done and massacred all of the Muslims. So, therefore we can say the Banu Amir was kind of divided. Some of them were supporting the bulk and the elder and that is the main person who gave the, the uh, a man who gave the uh, treaty to the Prophet ﷺ. and some of them were supporting uh, the younger nephew and the one who had committed the massacre. So these two people that were killed, they were not known. The, the Sahabi Amr ibn Umayyah, he did not know the whole story. He assumed the entire tribe had committed treason, right? He assumed the whole tribe had committed treason. So basically it's self-defense and also, frankly, vengeance, both. It's self-defense that, look, if they find out I'm a Muslim, they'll kill me. And then there's also vengeance. They killed all of us, so we need to now go back and attack. He didn't know the whole story. He didn't know all of that. So, this is an innocent life that has been taken. In fact, two innocent lives. So, we said the Prophet ﷺ promised to pay the blood money. The blood money is a massive amount. A hundred camels is no joke. Multiplied by two gives you two hundred camels. This is a fortune. And... According to the constitution, the Treaty of Medina, any time there's an affair that afflicts the whole city, everybody must join together and help out. And this makes it easier because when you have 
3,000, 4,000 people all paying for 200 camels, this will work out to something that's very affordable for every person. Right? Now, footnote here, pause here. Islamic law, many of you don't know this, it's very interesting. Islamic law stipulates that in cases of accidental manslaughter, the blood money will be paid by the entire tribe. Not just by the one person. Now, in the case of murder, then the punishment is on the murderer. In case of accidental manslaughter, then in fact, the entire tribe will chip in to help the tribesmen. And this is one of those issues where in modern fiqh, we have no idea what to do. We need to rethink, yani modern ijtihad needs to be done. Because you cannot afford a hundred camels, right? A hundred camels is simply too much for one person to afford. So what would the, the uh, tribe do? The tribe would have a fund. This is pre-Islam and also post-Islam. The tribe would have a general fund that every member of the tribe would give to the general fund. This is now the treasury of the tribe, right? So if one of the members of the tribe uh, ma accidental manslaughter. Accidental manslaughter, in our times you drive a car accidentally, you kill somebody. This is accidental manslaughter, right? Manslaughter by definition generally is accidental. So, Islamic fiqh stipulates you have to pay blood money and fast two months, correct? Now, fast two months is on yourself. Paying blood money, the, the, the books of fiqh and also these in, in the hadith state that the tribe will help out the Muslim. Your tribe will help out. And what is the ratio of you and the tribe? This will be decided amongst yourselves. No doubt the one who does the crime has to pay the big percentage, but the tribe will see, okay, what is your status? If you're a multimillionaire, then maybe you pay the whole. If you're not that rich, then you pay 10% and 90% divided on all of us. So if there are 2,000 people, then everybody pays $10, $20, and mashallah, tabarakallah, all of it will, uh, will be uh, put together. So this is actually fiqh. Islamic fiqh has it to this day. Now, getting back to our story. So we have a lot of money, so we have to collect it from everybody in the city. And one of the largest tribes and one of the wealthiest tribes is the Yahudi tribe of the Banu Nadir. Hence, we get to the story of the Banu Nadir. How did the Prophet end up in Banu Nadir? Because he wants help in paying the blood money for something that is common for the entire city of uh, Medina. Uh, now, uh, this is not the first time we're hearing of the Banu Nadir. The Banu Nadir have played minor roles in the past and this is now they're coming up again and again. There have been previous troubles uh, with them. Uh, the first of these troubles, uh, in fact, we did not mention in this particular class and that's because it is an isolated incident that does not involve the whole tribe uh, but it does involve a segment of them and we learn from uh, one of the books of uh, Hadith and that is uh, the Musannafa Abdul Razak, we learn that the Banu Nadir, some of them, they conspire to murder, literally in cold blood, some of the Muslim, uh, yani of the Sufa, the people of the, yani you can call them the ulama, basically. These are the, the, the ones who are in authority and respect, right? And they were only discovered, Allah willed it, of course, that one of them, yani they shared the plot with somebody who then told the Muslims, so it's a long story, but basically eventually Allah exposed their plot, no harm was done. No harm was done, but the plot of murder was concocted by a group of them, but not the whole tribe. So they were not uh, punished as a uh, group. Now we also learn from uh, one of the early Sira authorities, Musa ibn Uqba. He says that the Banu Nadir helped the Quraysh in the battle of Uhud with logistics and with the lay of the land, geography. And this makes a lot of sense because how would the Quraysh know where to camp and where to have the best place to meet the Muslims. So here we learn from Musa ibn Uqba is one of the early authorities in the second century along with Ibn Sa'd and others. He's of the classical authorities of the Seerah. Musa ibn Uqba says, it was the Banu Nadir who was helping the Quraysh in the battle of Uhud. So this is very recent, it's fresh. How did they help them? By guide. By telling them where to camp and what to do. Right? So they know the lay of the land. The Quraysh don't know the lay of the land. So the Banu Nadir becomes the guide of the uh, Quraysh. Uh, now, yet another point that is adding to the whole tension with Banu Nadir, the entire incident of Ka'b ibn Ashraf. Remember Ka'b ibn Ashraf, right? Ka'b ibn Ashraf, remember, what was his lineage? Who can remind me? Half Arab, half Yehudi. Father's side, and see, he's a very unique, he had a very unique uh, position, the Arabs considered him Arab, the Yehudi considered him Yehudi. Why? Because his mother was from the Banu Nadir and his father was from the pure Arabs. 
So he had he, the, basically the best of both worlds, and he was, as we said, he was considered to be very handsome, flatteringly handsome, and he had a big ego because when he, when his, that's how they killed him, wasn't it? Right? That they praised his good looks and his hair and whatnot, and he just khalas, he fell for it because he had that exotic, if you like, mix. He was also the poet. He was also one of the richest businessmen. He had his private fortress. He didn't live with the rest. He had his private fortress uh, because the Yehud had their fortresses. They didn't live like the Arabs lived. They have even a different architecture. And um, somebody should research this up. This is not my speciality. Perhaps somebody who's listening or somebody who's expert in architecture. Uh, this is an interesting question which will shed light on what is the origin of the Yehud. Where did they come from? Where did they learn how to build fortresses? This is not something the Arabs would do. This is something coming from elsewhere. Right? So this is a question beyond my expertise. People who are experts in uh, history of architecture should discover because there's still a big question, where did these people come from? We still don't know. Remember I gave a whole three, four, five theories, if you remember, so many months ago. Uh, and this is one of those factors we can use to narrow it down. Um, was it Yemen? Was it Syria? Was it, uh, was it uh, you know, wherever it was? Uh, this is one of the questions that can be used. In any case, Ka'ab ibn Ashraf, the whole situation of Ka'ab is linked to the Banu Nadir because they consider him one of their chieftains, one of their elite. Even though he's not uh, the big guy, he's not the chieftain per se, but he's one of the elite and he's one of the most respected of the Banu Nadir. So by eliminating him, the Banu Nadir automatically are feeling tension and obviously anger and whatnot. So there's quite a lot of minor incidents that are working up to something big. So there was tension amongst the Muslims about walking to uh, the Banu Nadir and asking for the blood money. Nonetheless, the Prophet Abu Bakr, Umar, and some of the core Sahaba, one day they decided to basically walk to the Banu Nadir and uh, the Banu Nadir lived south of Medina. So they made a day trip down to uh, their, uh, their, their plantations and the Banu Nadir, as was the case of, of uh, the Yahud that were involved in agriculture, they had massive lands of date groves and date palm trees and in the middle of these date palm trees they would build these special uh, fortresses and every mini tribe would have their fortress right every mini tribe would have their uh, fortress and this was something unique for the Yehud the Yehud of Khaybar had it as well and the Yehud of Yathrib had it as well and other Yehud has it as well and as I said that's a separate question which how are they all linked uh, together so uh, when they saw the Prophet and the Sahaba the, the leaders amongst them welcomed them and they were very, uh, they showed a lot of happiness. And one of them said, it is about time you came to us for our help, meaning we're doing a favor to you now. It's about time you, you came to us and, and asked us because we're the ones who we should be helping you out, basically. And so uh, they put him outside of the fortress and he said, wait here, let us go and figure out what we're going to do. And it is said that the Prophet ﷺ sat down with the Sahaba and the fortress is uh, uh, above them. And when they entered back in, they began disputing amongst themselves. One of them said, this is our opportunity, let's take it. He's sitting right under the wall of the fortress. Let us go to the top and we can... And that's the, how they protect fortresses. They have their big items, right? They have their rocks. All of this is prepared because that's what you do with the fortress, right? And we can throw a rock on him and khalas, our problems are eliminated. With the elimination of the leadership, what will the Muslims be able to do after that? And another said, no, this is going to cause a lot of, uh, obviously, uh, backlash and whatnot. Eventually, the plan was enacted that, yes, let us simply go to the top of the turret, go to the top of the, uh, of the uh, uh, fortress, and khalas, we have it ready right there. We're going to lower directly onto the Prophet system. We're talking about a matter of minutes now, because this is all prepared. That's what a fortress is, right? So, immediately, and the Sahaba were not understanding why, the Prophet ﷺ stood up and just walked away. Immediately. And later on, he informed them that Jibreel had come and told him. Right? But outwardly, the Sahaba had no idea what is going on. The Prophet ﷺ simply stood up and walked away and returned to Medina without even saying one word, because Jibreel had said, stand up right now and just leave. So he's going to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Jubilee. He literally stood up and walked away without even uttering one word about where he went. The Sahaba waited, waited, waited. The Yehud had no clue. They're waiting for him to return as well. And so eventually, um, they didn't do anything because the Prophet was not there. So the Sahaba returned back to Medina and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, I mean, he informed the Sahaba that Allah Azza wa had told him that they had a plan to kill him. They had a plan to kill him. So this is the famous incident that we all hear about that the Yahud wanted to throw a rock on him. This is the Banu Nadir. 
This is when it takes place. The Banu Nadir, when he was sitting under their fortress, ostensibly, according to one report, they said, okay, yeah, great, you're here, you know, we're going to prepare a massive feast, just wait, let us do the, the, the work for you. Let us basically welcome you. Obviously, you don't have secretaries coming and arranging this. In those days, you just walk and you do it, right? So the, the process of them comes unexpected. So actually, it's understood that it's going to be a little bit of, okay, wait, let us prepare the place for you, right? Let us prepare the fortress, let us throw a feast for you. So there's nothing fishy, per se, for having him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wait outside while they prepare and they get a feast and they sacrifice an animal. This is understood. So this is, as we said, how they took advantage of the protocol that it makes complete sense for them to do what they're doing and uh, they tried to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, later on, many years later he reveals Surah Al-Ma'idah and uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah of course it was one of the last surahs revealed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referenced in one ayah just in passing this incident and then he moved on to talk about more fresh incidents right so to begin the story of the treachery of that entire group Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 11 that Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu udhkuru ni'mat Allahi alaykum idh hamma qawmun an yabsutu ilaykum aydiyahum fa kaffa aydiyahum ankum that oh you who believe remember the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on you when a group from amongst you desire to reach you to kill you idh hamma qawmun an yabsutu ilaykum aydiyahum what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fa kaffa aydiyahum ankum Allah stop their hands from reaching you Allah stopped their hands from reaching you. So Allah, now the Surah Al-Ma'idah is all about the treachery of this group and what they have done. This is like the very first reference. This happened and then this happened and this happened. So the whole story goes on. So this is something Surah Al-Ma'idah came down perhaps four years after this incident. right? So Allah mentions, remember when that happened. Wadhkuru, remember when that happened. And that reference, according to Ibn Abbas, he said, this is when the Banu Nadir attempted to uh, eliminate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu then returned back and he told the Sahaba, Abu Bakr Umar waited. When he didn't return, they realized something is up and he's there, they're seeing him walk away. So they went back to Medina and he told them the whole story. And then he sent a messenger through Muhammad ibn Maslama uh, to back to the Banu Nadir to tell them in detail this is what you said, this is what you did and so he's exposing the plot, I know exactly what happened this is what you said to him, he said this to that and because of this I have given you uh, the, uh, the, the only option that you have is to leave in 10 days to leave in 10 days and if I see any of, of you, if, if we see any of the Banu Nadir after this, then this will be the uh, death penalty for them. You have 10 days to leave. And initially when they heard this, obviously they were uh, caught by surprise. They knew exactly they were at fault. So uh, they tried to argue with Muhammad ibn Maslama. Muhammad ibn Maslama was a friend of theirs in the days of Jahiliyyah. Uh, and he said, how could you be doing this to us? Muhammad ibn Maslama said, Islam has come and changed everything. My friendship is now with those who have Islam. Islam has come and changed everything. The wala and bara or the um, loyalties and friendships, all of this is now in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His uh, Messenger. So they were late, literally caught red handed, so they agreed. And they said, okay, we'll leave. When news of this spread in Medina, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the head of the hypocrites, could not believe that his friends and his allies and his entourage, the Banu Nadir, he was friendly with all of the uh, Yahudi tribes, all of them, and especially the Banu Nadir, and Ka'b ibn Ashraf was a personal friend of his. So Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul could not believe that they would be expelled. And so he sent them a message. And that message was extremely frank and extremely harsh. That he said, that no matter what happens, they're not going to leave Medina. He will take care of them. And he will guarantee their protection. And he is not going to listen to anyone who tries to kick them out. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ. And if need be, he will fight with them against any who fights, meaning the Prophet ﷺ. And worst case scenario, he said, if you are expelled, I will be with you walking away from Medina as well. Self-exile, khalas. Right? So look at this. He is one of the leaders of pre-Islamic Yathrib. In fact, as we said many times, he is the senior most leader from that generation. And he is 
telling the Banu Nadir so many oaths and qasams, he's swearing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is not going to obey anyone against them, he will fight for them, he will defend, he will, he will. And so obviously when the, when the and he also says, I forgot to mention, he says, I have called my allies from the Ghatafan, which is one of the larger tribes up north. I have called my allies from the Ghatafan. They will come 2,000 strong and the, the, together, the both of us, me and them, we will defend you against any who seeks to harm you. Now, when you have Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul telling you all of these things, I mean, if you don't have Iman, you will be persuaded. You will be persuaded. This noble chieftain of Jahiliyyah, he is saying his own self-imposed exile. I mean, what more do you want? Like, if you are exiled, don't worry, I'm going to be exiled with you, right? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed this in the Quran. We will mention this uh, later on. Um, that Allah says, even if you, uh, you know, uh, Allah azza wa jal, wallahu yashhadu innahum lakathibun. Allah testifies that he's a liar even as he says this. He has no intention of fighting with you, right? That if you are fought, he is not going to defend you. And if you are exiled, he's not going to leave with you. This is in the Quran, it will come to these ayat in a while. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed the plot of uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, but the Banu Nadir don't believe in the Quran in the first place, so it's a vicious loop here. Nonetheless, so uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay assured them that we will fight with you, we will, as we said, uh, stay with you to the end, and وَلَا نُطِيعُ فِيكُمْ أَحَدًا أَبَدًا This is in the Quran. We will not obey anybody against you. Meaning the Prophet وَلَا نُطِيعُ فِيكُمْ أَحَدًا أَبَدًا Never ever are we going to obey anybody against you. And Allah says, وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ Allah is testifying this, this person is a, is a liar. So when this came back, the Yahud began, the Banu Nadir began amongst themselves what to be done, what is to be done, and their chieftain amongst them, Huyay ibn Akhtab, and Huyay ibn Akhtab, his daughter is Safiya, and Safiya is to become one of the Ummahat al one of the final Ummahat al -Mumini. This is after the Battle of Khaybar. Right now we're talking about Banu Nadir. The Battle of Khaybar is still three years away. So this is still time left for that. But this is the father of Safiya binti Huyay. This is Huyay. Huyay ibn Akhtab was one of the main chieftains of the Banu Nadir. So Huyay ibn Akhtab, um, and we know about him uh, that uh, Huyay and his brother, his name was Yasir as well. So Yasir and Huyay are two brothers. And Safiya herself tells us the story. Safiya, she flipped around from her previous religion and she became uh, one, the, one of the Ummahat al Mu'minin and she was a believer in Islam, obviously. Uh, and so she tells us the reality of uh, her father and her uncle that uh, she says that when the Prophet first came to Medina, that my father and uncle were somewhat excited that maybe this is the person, maybe this is the one, right? And we learn from many other books, and we know this for a fact, that uh, they were expecting someone to come and revive their religion. And we said this many times. Uh, it's mentioned in the Quran as well. And they would threaten the Arabs that when we get this person, khalas, we will overcome you. So they had some premonition. It might be, it might be the one. But at the same time, they didn't expect this person to be from other than them. So they went to find out, is it him or not? Safiya herself tells us the story. That Safiya says, I was a young girl, five, six years at the time. And I was the beloved of my father and my uncle. They would always play with me and uh, you know, um, uh, cherish me. So when I saw them coming back from Medina, I ran out to meet them, happy, jumping for joy. And they didn't even pay any attention to me. Completely gloomy, sad. They, get, they completely ignored me. And so I listened to them, what are they saying? And so uh, my uncle Yasir said to uh, Huyay, her father, uh, Hua who? Is he the one? What is your opinion now? And he responded back glumly and sadly that, E wallahi huwa who? That by Allah, he is the one. So her uncle said, what, do you, what is your position? What are you going to do? So he responded to be his enemy as long as I live. I can't expect anybody, uh, I can't accept anybody who's not from basically my, uh, my uh, uh, you know, ethnicity or tribe or whatnot. I will not accept anybody from outside of my uh, group. So, uh, to be his enemy as long as I live. And this is one of the reasons that Safiya herself was willing to embrace Islam because she realized that her people were in uh, misguidance. In any case, in the battle of the Banu Nadir or in the issue of the Banu Nadir, so Huyay ibn Akhtab, he decided 
to take a stand. And he believed the promises of Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul. And so there was some tension between his own people. And Allah mentions this in the Quran. We're going to talk about these ayat. Tahsabuhum jami'an wa qulubuhum shatta. You think they're one group. O oh, Muslims, you think they're one group. Tahsabuhum jami'an wa qulubuhum shatta. But amongst themselves, they have so many different groups. They have so many different, their, their hearts are not reconciled. So, Huyay wanted to fight. Many of the other Yahud did not want to fight. And they had a mini, not a fight, but you know, uh, verbal, if you like, altercation, if you like, inside of their fortress. Finally, Huyay wins over, so they decide they're going to fight. So they send a messenger back to Medina. Initially, they've agreed to leave. When Abdullah ibn Ubay convinces them, now they're going to stay. So they send a messenger back to Medina, and the uh, messenger goes to the Prophet wasallam and says, uh, o Muhammad وسلم, we have decided to stay, so do whatever you want. Blatant threat. Do whatever you want. If ma badalak, which is a height of arrogance, you know. Khalas, do whatever you can. It's like you know, so you threaten somebody, right? Do whatever you want. And as soon as the Prophet وسلم, heard this, he exclaimed, Allahu Akbar. Meaning Alhamdulillah, right? Allahu Akbar. And the Sahaba, when they heard this, they started making takbir as well because they realized that this is going to turn out for their positive, not for their negative. It's going to turn out for the positive and we will see what a big positive it was. So uh, they began to arm themselves and immediately, the same day, the Prophet ﷺ took a large group, some say around 700 or so, uh, and he Within the day, he reached their fortresses and he began laying siege to them. And even they were shocked, the Yehud were shocked at how fast the process of mobilized an army and was there basically instantaneously. Like they were expecting two, three days, a week. The same day, like literally, within a few hours, mobilization was done, the Sahaba there, and khalas, they're at the gates. So now, they're waiting for Abdullah ibn Ubayz ibn Salud's promise. Now they're waiting. You promised us. And guess what? Absolutely nothing. Abdullah ibn Ubay did not lift a finger. He didn't do anything. After all of these promises that he told them, no help came. He himself did not go and fight against the Muslims, nor did he do anything in the exile. And so, as the days clearly demonstrated that Abdullah ibn Ubay was not going to do anything. Some say the, the Hisar or the, the uh, siege lasted for a week, some say 10 days, but there was no fighting because they were waiting for external help to come. There's no way that this group can fight the entire people of Medina. And during this time to demonstrate for you how confident the Muslims and the Prophet in particular were. So, We've already said that after Badr, the Banu Qainuqa was expelled. We talked about their story. So now we have the Banu Nadir, and then we, uh, sorry, not the, uh, the, yeah, the Banu Nadir, and then we have the Banu Qurayla, right? So these are the three main groups, right? The Banu Qainuqa, we've already done that. The Banu Nadir, we're doing it now. The Banu Qurayla, and that's the really controversial because that ended in a, uh, in a uh, execution for all of the males, adult males amongst them. Now, to show us the confidence of the Muslims, the Prophet left. The Banu Nadir is still in siege, with a group obviously still, still uh, you know, outside the fortress. And he, along with the majority of the Sahaba, went to the Banu Qurayla, the third of them. right? And the reason he did this was to rejuvenate and renew the contract of Medina and the constitution of Medina, and to make them give oaths again, that they are with us or not. And this is very important because a lot of people view Banu Qurayla in isolation. Banu Qurayla, don't get confused now. I know these names are... Banu Qurayla is going to happen no. in a year and a half. The Banu Qurayla. The Banu Qurayla is the execution, right? That's perhaps the biggest smear that is done upon the honor of our Prophet ﷺ by uh, those who are not uh, sympathetic to Islam. They say the issue of the Banu Qurayla is perhaps the biggest smear that is done because it, it resulted in the execution of hundreds of adult males. People do not realize that there's a whole history going on here. And just right now, in this incident of Banu Nadir, the Prophet goes to them again and says, look, and this is already after the Banu Qaynuqa, both of the tribes, the, the Banu Nadir and the Banu uh, Qurayla affirmed, okay, no, no, we're going to uphold the treaty, don't worry. Once again, the Prophet is going. 
and saying, are you going to uphold or not? If you want to go, then break it. Don't, don't betray. And the Banu Qaynuqa agree for the third time. Right? The Banu, uh, sorry, Banu Qurayza. The Banu Qurayza. For the third time, with solemn oaths to renew the promise. Right? So, when Khandaq happens, and they betray the Muslims, the worst betrayal imaginable, then honestly, we need to look at the whole context. Right? Even the Banu Nadir right now did not betray even a fraction as much the Banu Qaynuqa, the Banu, uh, the Banu uh, Quraidha did. Even a fraction. Because the Banu Quraidha, uh, we we're jumping the gun here, but you all know the story. The 10,000 people surrounded the, the entire city of Medina, and now within, there's a fifth column. At the most... At the most difficult and the most awkward time, now within the Banu Qurayza flip around, right? And the Muslims are scared for their own women and children now because they cannot protect the city and their wives at the same time. You're either at the gates of the city or you're in your house. You can't be both. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, your hearts were in your, this in the Quran, your hearts were in your chests, right? Your hearts were in your chest. We even have an expression in English, right? And you began thinking thoughts of Allah. Even the Sahaba, their iman was tested. Right? We're jumping the gun here, but I'm putting this into perspective. What happened to them happened not because of their religion, not because of their ethnicity, but because of their actions. And because they broke solemn oaths multiple times and this is the last time they're going to swear a new solemn oath that we will uphold the constitution and we will not betray you so the process then left the uh, Banu uh, Quraidha and then returned back to the Banu Natir right so look at the confidence he himself had now because also realized that there was a threat that the uh, uh, Banu Quraidha might help the Banu Nadir in this time there was a threat that the two will join up. So he sends, he goes there as well to make sure you're not going to join up. To show them the strength of arms as well. The bulk of the army actually left the Banu Nadir. Just a small contingent remained outside. And they marched to the other side to go to the Banu Quraidha. Right? And this also shows you how helpless the Banu Nadir were. When the bulk of the Muslims, they still can't do anything. Because they don't, they're just completely cut off. So when they realized this, one more thing happened which completely demoralized them. And this is uh, a bit of a controversy, but frankly I don't see much of a controversy. As usual, as you know, my methodology is to be frank here and not to sugarcoat. And you, when you be frank, you see there's reasons to, for everything that happens in our seerah. So uh, one more issue that really demoralized them. Uh, the Banu Nadir prided themselves in their orchards, in their date palms, in their groves. And they had massive lands, hectares, lots of lands full of date palms. And it, as you, um, uh, you know, realize, it's not easy to maintain. It's not easy to grow. They have it all done in nicely, you know, in uh, uh, the agriculture. If you like, the, they have the rows of water, and they have all of the, uh, the, the amenities that are needed to have a garden. They have it all pr pr planted nicely. And most importantly, the trees are now ripe, which takes, on average, a date palm would take between five to eight years to get to that size that is needed, right? This is just the beginning. So for the first, basically, eight to nine years, you're not going to get anything. You just putting in the effort. Then when the tree is up, now it will last, alhamdulillah, a decade or two, right? So, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa burnt down groups of the date palms. And they are watching from, from the fortress. Now what's gonna happen, right? This was too much for them. Like this is the, this isn't just money, this is effort, this is, uh, this is the prize. This is everything, right? And they began lamenting, and they began wailing and crying, and some of them even said that uh, you are calling for peace. What type of peace is this that you're destroying? You know the the the, the agricultural products, and this actually caused. Uh, some of the people to question, well, uh, should we destroy or not? And Allah revealed in the Quran, and we'll talk about this, uh, you know, what Allah Azza wa Jal revealed in the Quran. And when they saw this, and they saw no help was coming, and the days turned into uh, probably a week, maximum 10 days, we, between 7 to 10 days, and they realized, khalas, there's no exit strategy, what not, so they agreed to basically unconditionally surrender, right? And frankly, the Prophet was very generous with them, very generous with them. After they have attempted to assassinate him, 
and this is something the chieftains have done not some 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 you know guy on the street this is like by shura between them and they officially decide to basically assassinate him he forgives them their lives their properties their uh, women and children and as much as their camels can carry just leave and frankly many would say this is very generous just leave get out of here exile and take whatever you can that's pretty generous just one condition don't take weapons it's very fair don't take weapons right so frankly nobody can really have anything to say about the Banu Nadir the Banu Nadir demonstrates, if anything, the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ, that he did not impose any type of major financial, if you like, taxation on them or anything, other than, obviously, what can you not take when you leave? The agricultures, right? That was the main issue, right? And they had to confiscate that. They had to basically not, the, the, the Muslims confiscated it because of their uh, treachery. And therefore, uh, the Banu uh, Nadir pack their belongings as much as they could, so much, and they realized that the Muslims would then, uh, you know, take over their fortresses and their houses, and so out of sheer spite, really, they took axes to their own houses, and they hacked down these beautiful treasures. Now, it is well known in the seerah that, and as I said, this is a whole different tangent that I'm not qualified to even get into, their architecture was much more advanced than the Arab architecture. And they knew how to construct in a way that the Arabs did not know, right? And they prided themselves, and this is why it was so difficult. The Banu Nadir, and then the Khaybar is much more difficult as we're going to come to. They had the most massive fortresses in the entire Arabian Peninsula, was in Khaybar, right? So, what's happening now, Banu Nadir? They destroyed their own fortresses and palaces. And they took an axe to their own, every person to his own house. And this was a punishment that Allah meted out at them. Imagine how painful it is for a person to imagine breaking down his own house, frankly, that he himself built. We don't build our own houses. They build their own houses. They have lived in it. Their children have been born, their grandchildren have been born. This is their prized possession. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَذَاقُوا وَبَالَ أَمْرِهِمْ They tasted the penalty of what they themselves have done. Right? And what is happening in the next is even more as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions. And so, uh, and Ibn Ishaq mentions that as they went, uh, you know, out and they went into exile, uh, the people of Medina gathered to see their, the procession leave and it was an amazing sight, he said. The amount of wealth that they had hidden in these fortresses, or not hidden is probably not protected or accumulated over the centuries. Uh, the treasures and the fabrics and the brocades and the jewels that the, the, the Sahaba were simply amazed how much wealth they had allocated and the camels almost dying with stuff on their back because they're not going to leave one thing you know this right they're not going to take one they're not going to leave a single uh, thing for anybody to take they will take any everything they possibly can and so everybody's walking even the kids are walking because they want the camels to carry the goods right so every camel is creaking with stuff piled to the very top and they're making their way through and the sahaba are simply just shocked to see how much wealth was actually stored and um, many of them it is said they even took their doors because the door in those days the door was the most um, uh, prized if you like uh, you know uh, craftsmanship and architecture you're going to carve it out and whatnot they're putting the door on top of the camel Right? They don't even want to leave the door. <laughs> leave, just take everything as you can. Uh, and so uh, they, they were allowed to leave. And it is said that two or, two or three of them accepted Islam. And so they were allowed to remain with their, with their possessions. And subhanAllah, look at the fairness of the religion that anybody who accepts Islam, khalas, instantaneously, you protect yourself and your family and your possessions. So uh, the few who converted, uh, they were allowed to keep their goods and remain uh, in, in whatever lands they had. And the rest of it, the rest of it, uh, some of the Sahaba began a discussion what is to be done with it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran, this is not ghanima. This is another term called fay. And fay is a whole different chapter in fiqh. And 
Fate is that which is captured without any war and without any fighting and without any bloodshed. And the rules of fate are very different than the rules of Ghanima. Now, before I move on, let me just say, all of these rules, frankly, in modern times, they really hardly apply at all. For many reasons, not just because there's no, yani, hardly any or, or no real jihad going on, but also because these rules were meant for an army of volunteers. A paid Muslim army. Suppose you're in an ideal Islamic land that has an army. This army is getting a salary. These rules don't apply instantaneously. Khalas. These rules don't apply. The whole rules of Ghanima and Fain, all of these things, they apply to the situation of those times. When you had to basically volunteer, you, not, you have no idea what's going to happen, uh, you're using your own horse, you're using your own weapons, right? Whole different, there was no paid army in early Islam. So when I say these rules, one needs to understand, these rules are nice to know, you know, from the books of fiqh and whatnot, but we have to be realistic here that these rules are not applicable for multiple reasons in our times. Nonetheless, fate is different than ghanima. Why? Because there's no fighting done. Fate is something that is captured without any threat of fight, without any physical blood being shed. And this is what happened, that uh, the, the Muslims clearly outnumbered the Banu Nadir. Not a single uh, gun, not a gun, not a single bow and arrow is fired, not a single sword is drawn. And therefore this is fate. So Allah revealed rules about fate. And basically, and it, no, no, no reason to go into all of the minutiae when it's not relevant to us, but a portion of the fate is given to the state. A portion is given to uh, the Prophet ﷺ specifically, and then there's an ikhtilaf, does it go to his, uh, the, the Alil Bayt or not? Uh, and uh, yani for example, the Shia group, they basically say this uh, one-fifth they give uh, to the Alil Bayt, and then in our times, anybody who takes their place, and so therefore the, uh, the, um, uh, the marji or whatever they have, the, these people, they take the one-fifth, and that's how they understand this. Now, from our fiqh perspective, that one-fifth, uh, indeed, it goes, uh, you know, to the Prophet and, and as for the Al Al Bayt and who qualifies, there's obviously ikhtilaf between the two of us. But yes, it does go to the Al Al Bayt a percentage, even in Sunni fiqh. Yes, it goes a percentage. But that's if you qualify as Al Al Bayt, which means you have a lineage and a shajara, then yes, you will get uh, a, a percentage of this. Uh, so a portion goes to the Prophet and a portion to the state, and the rest, the Amir or the Khalifa, in this case, the Prophet can do as he pleases. So what did he do? All of these acres and acres of land, he distributed it amongst the Muhajirun who didn't have any land. And this is a beautiful reward that will help the economy of the Ansar and the Muhajirun. Because up until this time, the Ansar were supporting the Muhajirun. And as you know, they would have their lands and done this and that. Now that we acquire, or the Muslim state acquires acres and acres of land, all of the Muhajirun who had no land, they don't, they don't own any land, they now take this land and they distribute it amongst the Muhajirun. So now the Muhajirun and Ansar are a little bit more equal. And it is also mentioned in Ibn Ishaq that three of the Ansar who had no land and had participated in a number of battles, they also got part of this. So the process is being fair here that those who don't have any, they will now get uh, this part of the uh, land. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Hashr. The entire Surah Al-Hashr was revealed because of Banu Nadir. Right? So this is a very important surah to understand. And because it is such a short surah, and one of the things I'm very eager to do is to link the Quran with the seerah, I will in fact go over Surah Al-Hashr very quickly uh, so that we understand the entire incident of Banu Nadir in light of Surah Al-Hashr. Uh, surah Al-Hashr, by the way, Ibn Abbas refused to call the Surah Al-Hashr. He said, no, it's not Surah Al-Hashr. It's Surah to Banu Nadir. Or Surah to Bani Nadir. He refused to call Surah Al-Hashr. Why? Because he didn't want... Now, Hashr, what does Hashr mean? You should all know. The gathering. Now, when Allah uses Hashr, usually what does it refer to? Qiyamah. Whereas in this Surah, it doesn't refer to Qiyamah. Okay? In this surah, it doesn't refer to Qiyamah. That's why Ibn Abbas felt strongly that it should not be called Hashir. He goes, no, don't call it Hashir. Call it Surah to Nadir or Surah to Bani Nadir. Right? Because it's Surah to Bani Nadir. And the entire surah was revealed right after Banu Nadir. So reading the surah in light of what happened in Banu Nadir, we understand every single ayah. 
and the whole surah takes on a whole different meaning. So let us go over this very quickly, and it's a small surah, uh, just three, uh, three and a half pages. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is one of the uh, surahs that begins with Sabbah Lillahi, that all praise be to Allah, all that is in the heavens and earth, it praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He is Al Aziz Al Hakim. He is the one who has expelled the disbelievers from the Ahli Kitab, Banu Nadir. Kafaru min Ahli Al Kitab. Min diyarihim from their houses and their fortresses. Li awwalil hashr for the very first hashr. What does this mean for the very first hashr? So there's a number of uh, interpretations here, all of them are valid. When, when I say the first hashr, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The first implication. There's, there's going to be other hashrs. Right? There's going to be other hashrs. Right? And so there were other hashrs. There was the hashr in one sense of the Banu Qurayla. There was also the hashr of Khaybar. The same Banu Nadir were in Khaybar. Now, we're going to get there. I kind of should have said this. Where did they go? Majority of them went to Khaybar. What ha what's going to happen at Khaybar? Another catastrophe for them. So this is awwal al-hashr. That Allah is hinting. Don't worry. You, 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 we're going to deal with you again. Right, there's an implied meaning here. And then of course, let us never forget the ultimate hashr is also implied. Right? The ultimate hashr. You will also have the ultimate hashr that you're going to have to deal with. And that is Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So a beautiful verse here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is threatening them. Just wait. Your time has come. Li'awwal al-hashr. This is just the first. Right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا ظَنَنْتُمْ أَنْ يَخْرُجُوا some I, some people said this is a this is a uh, address to the Sahaba. You didn't think they would be expelled, but the stronger opinion is Allah is speaking directly to them. Allah is speaking to the Banu Nadir. Ma zanantum an yakhruju. You never thought that you could be expelled. Some have interpreted this to mean Allah is speaking to the Sahaba. You never thought that they would leave. But in fact, the stronger position, Allah is speaking to the Banu Nadir directly, right? <coughs> that you never assumed that this is going to happen. So Allah is speaking to them. And then Allah removes to the third person, we talked about this many times, iltifat, which is the change of, of pronouns. Uh, uh, and they assumed, the Yahud assumed, that their fortresses would protect them against Allah. A fortress is going to protect you against Allah. How foolish can you be? But Allah came to them from a place they could never expect. Allah came to them from a place they could never have expected that the Muslims will gather so quickly that will lay siege to them. Every one of their allies will be cut off. Allah Azza wa Jal arranged it. Uh, and Allah threw terror into their hearts. They were scared of the Muslims and what's going to happen. يُخْرِبُونَ بُيُوتَهُمْ They destroyed their own houses. بِأَيْدِيهِمْ With their own hands, they destroyed their houses. وَأَيْدِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And the hands of the believers. فَاعْتَبِرُوا يَا أُولِي الْأَبْصَارِ So take a heed. Learn some benefits. O people of vision and wisdom. Look at these arrogant people. They built their houses. They thought it would last forever. They ended up destroying their own houses with their own hands. Pay heed, O people of intelligence. Had it not been that Allah had already dec decreed that they would be evacuated or exiled, this would have been a worse punishment now. Actually, you're getting off easy now and Allah had decreed you'll get off easy. That you're only going to be exiled. As I said, frankly, the Prophet was generous in allowing them to take whatever they wanted to take, as much as their camels could possess. Go ahead and do it. So Allah is saying, yes, this I allowed it for you. I allowed it for you. وَلَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابُ النَّارِ But they have that punishment waiting for them in the hereafter. That is because they opposed Allah and His Messenger. And whoever opposes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah is severe in penalty. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا قَطَعْتُم مِّن لِينَةٍ أَوْ تَرَكْتُمُوهَا قَائِمَةً عَلَىٰ أُصُولِهَا فَبِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَلْيُغْزِي الْفَاسِقِينَ This is a reference to the cutting off of the trees. So there was even a dispute amongst the Sahaba. Dispute meaning, should we have, should we not have? What was the right thing to do? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, 
whatever you cut down of the uh, palm trees or those that you left standing whichever of these two both of them were done by the permission of Allah and in order to disgrace the fasiqeen so Allah is allowing this and this therefore shows us and there's an ikhtilaf amongst the four madahib but the bulk of them for the legitimate Islamic army they allow this type of destruction now realize this is problematic uh, at the time because the Muslims felt why are we destroying that which we will benefit from you see the problem here right is that these trees are going to come to us and yet we're destroying them so there was some back and forth like it doesn't make sense for us to destroy it they realize they're going to inherit this why should we destroy it? so allah revealed in the quran this was a tactic and it made them basically uh, resign and it made them humiliated and then allah reveals the issue of fate and whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afa'a, which means to give back or to restore to his messenger from them, you did not uh, spur your horses, horses and your camels. Meaning, this is the point here, you didn't fight for it. You did not fight. This is not ghanima, this is fate. And therefore, But Allah gives His messengers power over whomever He wills and Allah is capable of all uh, things. So Allah is uh, mentioning here, you didn't fight for all of this land. It was simply Allah's gift that He gifted. You didn't have to, you know, You didn't spur your horses on. Right? It was a calm issue. You knew you were going to win. There was never any fear from your side. And Allah gifted all of these lands. And therefore, مَا أَفَاءَ اللَّهُ عَلَى رَسُولِهِ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْقُرَى Whatever Allah restored to His Messenger from uh, the people of the Qura, meaning the Banu Nadir, then فَلِلَّهِ وَلِلْرَسُولِ Now this is now the fay rulings. It belongs to Allah and to the Messenger. And وَلِذِ الْقُرْبَى Most say, لِذِ الْقُرْبَى means al Bayt. And this is also the Sunni interpretation, as we said, right? Wal uh, yatama, the orphans. Wal masakin, poor people. Wabn is sabil, and uh, the uh, the wayfarer, right? Kayla yakuna dula tambein al agniya minkum. In order that this money, now this is a very deep verse, which has a lot to do with capitalism, has a lot to do with. Uh, uh, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor, and this has a whole other tangent which we don't have time to get into now. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, all of this wealth should be given to the orphans, the poor, the wayfair, the Ibn as Sabil. Why? So that it doesn't go round amongst the elite of you. Wallahi, these four words are of the most powerful verses of Islamic economics. And it destroys many versions of modern capitalism. The 1% versus the 99% and whatnot, right? The 1% owns 40% of this land. Think about that. Wallahi, it is it's just a number. Think about that. The wealth of the 1% is almost half. And I have a very strong premonition. It's only a matter of time. It will be more than a half. It's only a matter of time. It will be more than a half, right? Where that one elite 1% will own what all of the rest of the people own, like literally half-half, right? And Allah says in the Qur'an, one of the primary wisdoms of the laws of the Sharia, that money, لِكَيْ لَا يَكُونَ دُولَةً Dula is يعني, to go around, right? بَيْنَ الْأَغْنِيَاءِ مِنْكُمْ Money should not just go around between the rich and elite amongst you. Should filter down to the fuqara and yatama and masakin. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now this is related directly to the Banu Nadir property, but obviously, we base our Islamic economics on this ayah, right? One of the goals, maqasid al-shari'a, is that wealth should not just make the wealthier wealthy. Wealth should trickle down to society. So the public policies need to be done that enact this type of uh, vision. And then, وَمَا أَتَاكُمْ رَسُولُ فَخُذُهُ وَمَا نَهَكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ This is one of the most explicit verses that you have to obey the Prophet ﷺ. It was revealed for the fate of Banu Nadir. It was revealed for the fate of the Banu Nadir. Whatever the Prophet gives you, take whatever he stops from you, then don't be greedy for it. And we can extrapolate this for everything that he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Everything that he tells you to do, do it, everything he stops from you, don't do it. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِدُ العقاب. Have taqwa of Allah, indeed Allah is severe in punishment. Then Allah mentions the blessings of the Muhajirun and the Ansar. لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ As for the poor immigrants who were expelled from their houses, 
and they were expelled from their monies and they only wanted Allah's pleasure and they're helping Allah and His Messenger. These are the truthful people, meaning they will get this fate that we just talked about. And that's what happened, right? They gave up everything in Mecca, so they're going to get this now. They, and we gave stories, remember? Literally, they had to literally abandon their whole house, not get a penny for their house. And Allah rewarded them with much more in Banu Nadir, right? And when you give up anything for Allah, Allah will give you back more than that. And then Allah praises the Ansar. This is a, the wisdom of Allah. The Ansar might have felt something in their hearts that how come the Muhajirun are getting it, right? So Allah gave them such a praise that this ayah became one of the most beloved, if not the most beloved ayah to the Ansar. That Allah praises them in a way that is simply unbelievable. And there's another group as well. And they prepared the, the Dar is Medina, which is the city and the land. And they prepared before, من قبلهم, before the Muhajirun came. يحبون من هاجر إليهم They loved those who did the Hijrah. The Ansar loved the Muhajirun. وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا And they didn't feel anything in their hearts when they gave to the Muhajirun. Whatever they gave, you know, every one of us when we give, Shaytan comes, why did you give so much? Maybe we should have cut back a little. And Allah praises them. When they gave, they gave selflessly. They didn't feel anything in their heart. They want to prefer the muhajirun over themselves even if they are poor. Even if they're hungry. Even if they have less, they want to prefer somebody else. These are the righteous and the successful. So Allah praised the Ansar through their Iman. So the verse before says you're going to get the land, but then the Ansar are praised, you are the Muflihun, you have won, you have Falah because you have been so generous. And then there's even hope for all of us. We're next. We're next insha'Allah ta'ala, right? وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِن بَعْدِهِمْ And ask for those who come after them, and we are after them. We are after them, insha'Allah ta'ala. وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِن بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ They say, رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ so they didn't get the blessings of those two. But inshallah they'll get some blessings. And Allah gave us hope here. This is for us here, right? Those who came after them, they make dua for those who have gone before. They think good of them, right? And they say, Oh Allah, forgive our brethren who have come before us. And وَلَا تَجَعَ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلَّ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Do not put in our hearts any resentment towards those who have believed. إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ You are the most kind and the most merciful. And so anybody who has any hatred for the Sahaba, this verse has been deprived of him. أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ نَافَقُوا Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, the issue of Abdullah ibn Ubay and the Banu Nadir. Alam tara ila alladhina nafaqu Look at those who have nifaq Abdullah ibn Ubay Yaquluna li ikhwanihim alladhina kafaru They say to their brothers in kufr So they're also kafir But this is munafiq and this is Yahudi Right? Min ahli al-kitab And they come from ahli al-kitab So this is this, this is that But they're both the same In the rejection of Islam what does Allah say about Abdullah ibn Ubay? Now Abdullah ibn Ubay's message was secret, obviously. I mean, obviously, I didn't mention that, but it's understood. He didn't go tell the Muslims what he's saying, obviously. Allah exposed it. Allah exposes it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what, is, what does he say? لَإِنْ أُخْرِجْتُمْ لَنَخْرُجَنَّ مَعَكُمْ If you are expelled, we will go with you. وَلَا نُطِيعُ فِيكُمْ أَحَدًا أَبَدًا We will never ever, there's an emphasis here, أَحَدًا أَبَدًا There's an emphasis in Arabic, right? In English we'd say, we'd never ever listen to anybody who tries to go against you. وَإِنْ قُوتِلْتُمْ لَنَنْصُرَنَّكُمْ And if you are fought, we will be the ones who will defend you. We will fight against uh, for you. وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ Allah is testifying these people are liars. لَإِنْ أُخْرِجُوا if they are expelled, they will not walk with you. They didn't, he didn't go, right? And if they are fought, they're not going to help. They didn't help, right? And then Allah says, Suppose they even did help. Theoretically, right? 
they would be so cowards, they would turn back and run away. They did that at Uhud. Do you think they're going to do anything different now? Right? ثُمَّ لَا يُنصَرُونَ Then who's going to help them after them? لَأَنْتُمْ أَشَدُّ رَحْبَةً فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ You, meaning the believers, are more feared within their hearts than even Allah. Meaning, they are more scared of you than they are of Allah. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us something that only He can know. Right? That they have rejected me to such a level that they are more scared of you than they are of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَأَنْتُمْ أَشَدُ رَبَةً فِي صُدُورِ مِنَ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَوْمًا لَا يَفْقَهُونَ They don't think. They have no understanding. They're actually scared of humans more than they're scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah describes their cowardice. لَا يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ جَمِيعًا They will never fight all of you. They're never going to do this. إِلَّا فِي قُرَمْ مُحَصَّنَةٍ Except from behind those fortresses. They're not going to come to you in battle. They could have come to battle. They're not going to do that, right? أَوْ مِنْ وَرَاءِ جُدُرْ Or from behind their walls, right? Then Allah says, بَأْسُهُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ شَدِيدٍ Their violence between them is severe. تَحْسَبُهُمْ جَمِيعًا You might think they're one group. وَقُلُوبُهُمْ شَتَّى But their hearts amongst themselves, they are completely disunited. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَوْمٌ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ That's because they don't understand. Then Allah gives two examples and then we will uh, end because the end of Surah Al-Hashr, you all know it is the verses of uh, Allah's sifat, Allah's names and attributes. Then Allah gives two examples. Uh, the first example is for the Banu Nadir. The second example is for the Munafiqun. Okay? So if you're making notes over this, make them. verse 15 is for the Banu Nadir. Verse 16 is for the Munafiqun. As for the Banu Nadir, كَمَثَلِ الَّذِينَ مِن قَبْلِهِمْ قَرِيبًا didn't they see the example of the one right before them? Qaynuqa. Qaynuqa. Didn't they see what happened? Don't they learn from a lesson? Right? كَمَثَلِ الَّذِينَ قَبْلِهِمْ قَرِيبًا ذَاقُوا وَبَالَ أَمْرِهِمْ They tasted the bad consequences of their actions. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ and they're going to have a severe punishment. In other words, if you're not going to learn from Allah's revelation, learn from history. If you're not going to learn from the Quran, learn from history. Then Allah gives an example of the munafiqun. The example of the munafiqun is like shaitan. When he tells insan, ukfur, reject Allah. Then when insan does reject Allah, shaitan says, I didn't tell you, I have nothing to do with you. Meaning, you understand the relevancy, Abdullah ibn Ubay promises a million promises. When it comes to fulfill those promises, he disappears. I, what, I, what do I have to do with it, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal is comparing Abdullah ibn Ubay to shaitan. Literally. Literally. كَمَثَلِ shaitan. He is like shaitan. When he does all the damage, then he says, Whoa, I didn't do anything. Where are you coming to me for? Right? فَلَمَّا كَفْرَ قَالَ إِنِّي بَرِئُ مِنْكَ I have nothing to do with you. إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ I'm scared of Allah Azza wa Jal. So Allah is saying, فَكَانَ عَاقِبَتَهُمَا the both of their ends. Who are the both? The Munafiqun and the Banu Nadir. Right? Meaning, all types of kuffar. فَكَانَ عَاقِبَتَهُمَا أَنَّهُمَا The both of them. فِي النَّارِ Are in the nar خَالِدَيْنِ فِيهَا Again, duality. Right? خَالِدَيْنِ فِيهَا The both of them will be in the fire of hell. And that is وَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ الظَّالِمِينَ And that will be the end of those who do uh, dhulm. And then Allah Azza wa Jal uh, finishes Surah Al-Hashr. You all know Surah Al-Hashr, that beautiful ending of Allah's names and attributes. So, without understanding Banu Nadir's incident, Surah Al-Hashr is... You don't understand, right? And this shows us one of the main purposes of seerah is to understand the Qur'an. Now that you have understood Banu Nadir, Wallahi Surah Al-Hashr is as if everything is being painted in front of you. Every incident, right? And this is one of the main benefits of studying the seerah. And that's also one of the goals of my class, as you can see, that I always try to link the seerah and uh, the Quran, one final point of controversy, and then inshallah ta'ala we will uh, come back next next Wednesday. Uh, there will be a class next Wednesday. I made a mistake a few days ago. Next Wednesday we have a seerah. Two Wednesdays from now, I will have to pause. I have been invited to uh, Sweden, so I will be going far away trip, uh, but only for one week, and then we'll be back inshallah ta'ala. So next Wednesday we have seerah. Um, so one final point. There is somewhat of a controversy in the classical books. When did this incident take place? The Banu Nadir. And some of the biggest names of the seerah uh, in the first few generations of Islam, they said the Banu Nadir expulsion took place after Badr. 
And this is the opinion of Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri and Urwa ibn al-Zubayr. And the both of them are the most famous scholars of Sirah of the Tabi'un. They said it took place after Badr. However, later scholars corrected this and they said either this is a genuine mistake or they're confusing with the Banu Qaynuqa. Because, and this is the position of Al-Waqidi and Ibn Sa'd and Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq is a later scholar of the next generation, right? Uh, Ibn Shahab Zuhri is his teacher. Ibn Shahab Zuhri is one generation before Ibn Ishaq, right? So later on, and this shows us how much has been left for later scholars to come and re through and piece it together, right? They said it can't be after Badr. How so? Because the blood money only took place after Uhud. Remember, how did we begin the story? Why was the Prophet in the Banu Nadir in the first place? Right? Because of the, the blood money of Bi'r Ma'una. Right? So with this key fact, instantaneously, you have to piece it together and say, no, it couldn't have been after Badr. Because there was no blood money until the Bi'r Ma'una for, for the Banu Amit. And it says the Banu Amit, the, the, the blood money for the Banu Amit. This took place clearly after Uhud, and therefore the strongest position, this entire incident, it takes place uh, basically in the uh, Shawwal really of the uh, fourth year of the Hijrah, right? This entire incident, uh, the strongest opinion, Shawwal of the fourth year of the uh, Hijrah. And with this, inshaAllah ta'ala, we have two, three minutes of questions, and then... No, I said Safar was the... Uh, the Safar was Bi'r Ma'una. So it took a while to basically do all of this. Right? Safar was Bi'r Ma'una. And then Ramadan and then Shawwal of the fourth year of the Hijrah. Right? Yes? You mentioned the wife of the Prophet who performed the Nikah of the Prophet. Allah, I myself will have to look up. I myself will have to look up, but at the same time, generally speaking, there, uh, in terms of the, uh, what, what do you mean by who performed? No, 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 hold on, hold on, there, there's, there's a cultural element that we need to understand. Okay, I, I didn't understand your question. Let me let me rephrase the question, then I can explain it to you. So, uh, the question is, who performed the nikah of the Prophet wasallam? We need to understand there is a common myth that we have. There's a cultural myth. And that is somebody has to perform the nikah. And that's why I, the, caught me off guard. It took me out of sight. Nobody needs to perform the nikah. We are not like the Christians who believe that marriage is one of the seven sacraments, that a priest has to bless the union, and until the priest blesses the union, there is no marriage. No, we have no such equivalent. A marriage is a contract between the wali and the groom. And like any contract, like any contract, you don't need the presence of anybody other than Basically, the two people and the witnesses, the conditions need to be met, right? So, culturally speaking, we usually get an imam or a sheikh to perform the nikah because we want to make sure everything is done properly and because we want to give a good khutbah and nikah, right? But Islamically speaking, there is absolutely no shari'i requirement for there to be an imam or a sheikh or a hafiz or a mulana present. Okay, so all you need is the wali of the girl, the girl's approval obviously, the groom, the two witnesses, and khalas. That's all you need. Ijab and qabul is done and the conditions of nikah are met. So there is nobody that needs to do the nikah. So I did not understand your question now, now that you say it. There's nobody that needs to do the nikah of the Prophet ﷺ. But yes, for every single scenario, there was a wali for the girl. Aisha obviously, Hafsa obviously, the others had their walis, and the few that didn't, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he became their wali because, and it is allowed even in Islamic law, uh, that uh, sometimes it so happens that uh, a person will become the wali. This is Surah An-Nisa, the first ayat of Surah An-Nisa, right? That uh, if she agrees, uh, and uh, this is for Yatama, uh, 
فان خفتم الا تقصدوا اليتامى فانكحوا ما طاب لكم سائما مثل سوء فان خفتم الا تقصدوا في اليتامى going into a tangent here but in any case it is allowed now this is a, another quirk that people are going to raise their eyebrows at like what but if the woman is halal for you to marry and you are still her wali for example your second cousin's daughter she became an orphan and you you basically become her wali right something like this right so your second cousin's daughter even your first cousin's or even your first cousin is halal for you and it could happen it was common back then that a girl would not have anybody to take care of her except somebody who technically is not uh, a mahram and yet he becomes her wali so to be a wali you don't have to be a mahram Okay, so when the girl comes older, she's comfortable she t marrying somebody that she knows will take care of her and her money. Remember, we have to look at it from back then. She doesn't, might not want to marry a stranger. She's more than comfortable, you know, this person has taken care of me and I'm a teenager and I want to get married. I'm, I'm more than happy, right? So the wali, in this case, can do the nikah, as long as the two witnesses and the girl approves, right? And this is something that in a few occasions, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, so for example, uh, Maymuna and others who were uh, Malakat Yameen, so he has the authority over them because they are Malakat Yameen, their right hand possessions, right? So he says, I will free you and your freedom will be your mahar for marriage. They agreed. Safiya and Maymuna, both of them, they agreed, right? Safiya bint Huyay and others, th so uh, she was freed. And she doesn't need a wali because right now she's Malakat Yameen, she's Mulk Yameen. Right? And Mulk Yameen, the wali is basically the owner or the Islamic Khalifa in this case or the Prophet in this case. And therefore, uh, this issue of who performed the Nikah of the Prophet is a question rooted in cultural sensitivities and it does not have any uh, Shari need for that. Uh, one final question, Asif, and then we need to. We have no idea. Well, like a lot of these details are simply lost in the seerah. We have no idea. But we can obviously assume that would be the case. We can obviously assume that would be the case. Inshallah, we have two.